Hi, I'm Arthur Billingsley. I'm um, a resident of Jacksonville, Florida, and I live here in the area, and I fly this 310Q from Jacksonville up to Washington, D.C. every week. It's about a 600-mile nautical trip, um, and it takes me about three and a half hours to get there, which is not really that bad, um, but I think I'd like to cut that time down because in the course of a day, I go up on Monday mornings, I get there by 11 or 12, and by the time I'm in the office, it's about 1 to 1.30 and need to get started a little sooner than that. Um, so that's one of the reasons for looking to perhaps do it a little faster. But about the 310Q, this is a 1974 310Q, um, 5,300 pounds gross weight, uh, has about a 1,900 pound useful load, and full of fuel is about 600 to 700 pounds that you can uh, you can fill it up with and the range is about six and a half hours with 160 gallons uh, 160 gallons in four tanks and burns about 25 gallons per hour you can get that down to 22 if you're so inclined but I try not to uh, to run lean a peak so not to start one of those holy wars I'm <laughs> I'm uh, just running at rich a peak I uh, don't do the uh, the Lena Peak thing. Um, so 25 gallons per hour gets you about six and a half hours in this, and the range is right at about a thousand to 1,100 miles if you were trying to just uh, see how far you could get. Uh, great airplane, love this airplane. Uh, had it for about five years now, and before this airplane, I was uh, tootling around in a 177 RG, and the 177 RG is a wonderful airplane as well. It um, burns about 11 gallons per hour, and you can get about 130 knots out of it. Um, but the useful load is around 400, 400 and some odd with a full full few, which was 60 to 70 gallons, uh, which would give you about five hours. I was in the 177 RG because I was living in Charleston, South Carolina at the time, and flying up to Norfolk, Virginia and also up to Washington, D.C., and over to uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, retired Navy guy, and so I'm doing consulting back to the Department of Defense with a company called Oracle, and um, still doing that today. But being retired Navy means I go to all the Navy bases, Navy sites, as well as some of the, uh, the other defense sites as well in doing uh, uh, consulting. About this Q model, two Continental IO-170, IO 470s, uh, VOs, 260 horsepower per side, and again they burn about 25 gallons total, 12 gallons, 12 and a half gallons per side, uh, so it's pretty uh, pretty economical. And as far as a light twin goes, the reason I went to this from the 177 was one, I needed to carry more people, and two, I needed to go further. But the side benefit was, if I was going to a twin, I wanted to go to one of the uh, safer twins and so looking at the single engine performance of, of light twins and the only two choices were Baron and the 310s in terms of that had a great performance single engine and the 310 won in my case because uh, I looked at what was in it and for the value the 310 came up number one. The Cessna 310Q in terms of uh, range about a thousand miles you can go on these six and a half hours and the speed is anywhere from uh, 155 to 180 uh, in general. You can get it up to about 185 knots. Um, generally at uh, 8,000 feet with, um, you pull in about 22 inches of manifold and 2400 RPM, you can see about 175 to 180 knots, uh, depending on the temperature. And, um, this is a normally aspirated, it's not turbo, so a little higher you get better gas mileage and I normally fly eight to 10,000 feet, somewhere in there. Uh, I have done 12 to 14, but the speeds are slower and the gas use is slower. So you can even get down to uh, 20 gallons per hour at about 14,000 feet, but you're only gonna be doing about 160, 165 knots or so, which is not bad. As far as owning an airplane, I didn't know that I could even own an airplane. And this is coming from a, a military officer who's been flying a lot. Uh, general aviation was one of those things where I said, oh, I'll just rent one and 
and be done with it. But I started renting so much that it became a hassle because every time you rent an airplane, you have to do not only a pre-flight, but a pre-pre-flight. That is, you have to schedule. You have to hope the schedule holds, hope the maintenance is good. Uh, once you get there, you got to find the keys. Hopefully they've left the keys. I mean, there was so much hope that every flight became one of these, oh, I made it in the air. Um, and that got to be a hassle. And so I started looking at uh, what does it take to own an airplane? And it turns out it took about a year and a half or so of research to find out what it takes to own an airplane, only because I didn't go to some other owners first. I just did the research from scratch. That it's uh, basically another car. And if you need another car for work, you can own another airplane, uh, which is what I use this for. This is my commuter, and I commute in this, and I have a company that, uh, of course, takes care of a lot of the expenses. Um, and that's how I got into the first airplane was for commuting. I was driving the car that I had at that time from Charleston, South Carolina, up to Norfolk, Virginia, which is about a six and a half, seven hour drive and up to DC, which is about nine to 10 hour drive in the car. And so I started looking at uh, what does it take to actually fly? And it was a two and a half, three hour drive, uh, flight, I'm sorry, and a three hour flight uh, up to DC. So it became markedly better in terms of economics to fly. And with the Cessna 172, the 177s, and even the 182s to some respects, uh, you could get around 58 to 62 cents a mile is what it would cost uh, uh, for the operational cost. That's not the all-in cost, but that's just the operational cost, uh, which was right at where I needed to be to expense the clients and expense to uh, folks that, uh, uh, that I'm doing the work for. So that's great. Um, however, um, in owning your own airplane, there are some other things you got to take into account. Uh, one is insurance. Two is the maintenance, and you got to have a good maintenance team. And three is training. Uh, those three things are what your support team becomes. You got to have regular training, you got to have regular maintenance, and you got to have insurance. And the insurance is important because if anything does happen, you don't want this to be something that uh, you take on board yourself. It's not that you have to have insurance, you can have just liability liability only and that's cheaper but that doesn't protect you in terms of uh, making sure that your business can survive or that you can continue to do your business or get to where you need to be so include insurance when you're doing your calculations and the like uh, the training is important because that's part of your safety factor uh, being proficient is one thing but uh, there are some things that a, a good instructor can bring out or show you that you just don't get to do in everyday uh, everyday flying uh, one of the things that I do see, especially in flying the twin, about training is that you can get into a mode of flying so normally that nothing ever really happens. And so you need some time to experience and uh, go through these mental exercises of what if? What if you lose an engine or the gear doesn't come down or there's some other incident in air and you got to think through it rather than just pulling the checklist, which of course you can do but there's some memory items that you want to be sure to just be able to do right away. So training is an important part of owning your own airplane. Uh, the other part, number one part, is maintenance. Uh, the more you fly, the more maintenance you need. Generally all the airplanes, whether it's single or twin, you're going to need 50 hour oil changes. So uh, you want to calculate that in. Uh, right now, uh, unfortunately I'm in the 300 club, and flying some 300 hours a year, which is uh, means I'm doing about six oil changes a year. Uh, well, actually, it's four or five between annuals. But um, oil changes are, are good for a lot of reasons, but the main ones are this. Opening up the uh, engine and being able to look at the oil. Absolutely, if you can do a, a, a survey on your oil, on oil analysis, it helps to show that there's any patterns developing or anything that's, uh, that's coming. The other thing that's useful is bore scope, and um, you don't have to do that on every oil change, but once a year, you want to get in and look at those cylinders to see if there's any trends developing, any burns that are irregular, anything that's, uh, that's looking a little different on the cylinders. Uh, with that, it's a great safety part because 
the guys that I've flown with who have regular maintenance, um, none of them have ever experienced an engine failure. Um, engine failures are rare, but they're rarer still when you make sure that you're doing some regular maintenance on the airplanes. Uh, the engines themselves, the, uh, the design of these engines are from the 40s, and uh, so they're older designs, they're well known, and they can take a beating, but you just have to stay on top of the maintenance because uh, any little variances can cause some problems that develop into big problems. Uh, we call it the uh, uh, the critical chain or that chain of events that leads to an incident. And if you can stop those incidents back in pre-flight or maintenance or any kind of thing while you're on the ground, that's the time to do it. Have I ever done any owner assist annuals? Yes. Um, I try to do owner assist annuals and taking off the covers, the inspection plates, and certainly watching what some of the mechanics are doing in terms of looking in the, in the engines and parts they're pulling away. Um, the part that I don't do much of is when they pull out the seats and pull up the carpets and, and doing the, uh, the interior, other than looking at the, the rods, cables, pulleys, things like that, making sure that they, they look reasonably uh, good condition. Um, turning wrenches during owner assisted, uh, owner assisted annuals. I haven't done much of that other than uh, I had an alternator that I needed to put a, a pulley belt on and I did that. Um, I put in spark plugs. I pulled off the uh, fuel injectors and cleaned those but nothing major where you're pulling off a cylinder or doing some torque uh, uh, torque tolerances uh, to something like that. So on the cost of ownership, cost of owning an airplane, uh, with the 172, which is pretty common, 172, 177, the uh, insurance is going to be based on your number of hours and uh, whether you are instrument rated or not. If you are just a private pilot and you have about 500 hours or less, the insurance is going to be around $1,200 a year. If you are a private pilot, more than 500 hours and instrument rated, it's going to be about $800 a year. Um, and that's for insurance for 172, 177, something in that neighborhood. For the twins, um, they go up based on the airframe. The C310 is the uh, entry level uh, for the twins. And the insurance is going to be around $3,000 for a 500 hour pilot. Uh, if you're instrument rated and have about uh, 800 hours or so, you'll get it down to 25 to 2600, uh, depending on the, the whole uh, frame that you're covering it for. Generally, these are around 100 to 120 thousand dollars. If you're carrying, um, you know, one million plus uh, the whole value, which is going to be about 120 or so, it's going to be around 2500 to 3000 dollars. If you are having a, a higher hull value, like around $200,000, it'll be about $3,500. Um, so if you're interested in a 340, which is the next step up from this one, which is a um, pressurized cabin and um, turbo on the engines, um, that's going to be in the $4,000 range. Um, and so on up, you know, with each one, the 414, the Chancellor, um, that's going to be in the $4,500 range for insurance. And for the 421, which is the uh, Golden Eagle, uh, that's going to be right around five grand if you're paying about $400,000 for the airplane. Um, it could be five to six thousand dollars, but that's just to give you an idea of what it costs for insurance. As for maintenance, uh, regular maintenance on the 172. Uh, can range, not including consumables like oil, uh, your tires, um, and any of the other things that just normally deteriorate or, or have to be replaced. Your regular maintenance is going to be around $800 to $2,000 a year for 172, uh, 177, some, something in that neighborhood. Uh, the annual for 172, 177 is right around $1,500, uh, and it could be $3,000 depending on how often or how detailed the annual is, because there are going to be some some annuals where you have to catch up on maintenance. One of the things about general aviation, 
uh, that we both like and have to deal with is that we don't have scheduled maintenance as we do in turbines and jets where uh, there's a, a plan of scheduled maintenance and you know when it's going to happen. Well, we could do it in general aviation, but we just don't. <laughs> so normally there's going to be an annual that you come in and you're going to have to do a catch up where you're going to have to replace alternators or magnetos or uh, do a new starter or whatever. You're going to do one of those and that's going to be around $5,000 for 172, uh, 177, anything in that, that range. On the twins, the entry twins like this 310, you can expect your annual cost to be about $2,500 to $10,000 per annual. And the reason for that variance is there's more things that have to deal with. Um, if you've gone through a few annuals and gotten through all of the detailed uh, uh, maintenance, you can expect about three to $4,000 for an annual. Uh, but they're not gonna be cheap. Uh, so you factor that into your cost of ownership just as the hangar costs because you got to do it. You got to do it. Uh, what makes that cost variate so much, of course, is the twin engines because you've got two of each and they don't necessarily uh, wear at the same rate or cylinders don't have to be re replaced at the same time. Uh, the tolerances are different on each engine in terms of um, being tight. Um, over time, even little variances in how the valve seat can cause wear patterns that are different on the different engines and so they wear differently and so you have to replace different parts at different times and um, the cost goes up. Now if you're doing owner assisted you can cut that cost by 20 to 40 percent uh, depending on what kind of annual it is. Uh, opening the inspection plates making sure that you take the cowlings off and uh, uh, just taking care of that kind of labor can cut your cost by 10 to 20 percent. And the other thing that can be a factor is if there's any heavy lift or a thing where there's lots of bolts to undo or you have to write down all of where these bolts go, that saves you in labor as well. Uh, the going rate for labor at most of the shops around is $80 an hour. Uh, some, if they're in the city, are around 100 to $120 an hour. And um, you can expect uh, at least, uh, like I said, about $3,000 in labor costs and then about $2,000 in, in parts. Uh, tires for the 310, for instance, uh, the main tires are about uh, $200 each. Uh, the front's about, uh, it's about 200 also, it's 180. These are about 250, 220. And so uh, you go through those, well, now that I'm flying 300 hours a year, I go through them every two years. So uh, um, just the tires alone, that's 600 bucks that uh, I have to factor in. Uh, there's bearings, of course, with each one of those that you want the mechanics to look at. And the reason why I can't do a greater owner assist is because I'm not an AP like Adam is. <laughs> so being able to look at uh, different parts and tell if they're wearing, if they're okay, knowing what to look for, uh, that's the experience that you're paying for and it's worthwhile experience to pay for. The reason that you want to use mechanics uh, so that they sign off and say, yes, we've looked at the parts and we don't see any deterioration or any problems here. Um, the last annual I did, I went as they were pulling out some of the, some of the panels on the interior, we saw some uh, rust, well not rust, but uh, we saw some uh, problems with the aluminum. And I was able to take the panels out, scrub them down, clean them off, obey the rust or uh, corrosion is what I'm trying to say. Couldn't think of the word. It's an age thing. Uh, corrosion, I was able to obey that and so now it's good. And it's one of those things that why wasn't it caught at a previous annual? The answer is, I don't know. Either I wasn't looking or the mechanic wasn't looking. So while I like going to one mechanic all the time, it is good to have another mechanic that you trust look at your parts and planes and whatever because uh, you get a different set of eyes on it. Uh, for cost of ownership, uh, for this 310, um, the cost was 110 for the, uh, well, it was 100,000 for the plane. 
and generally they're still running 80 to 120 thousand dollars for a good good airframe this has about uh, 5,000 hours total time on it the engines are close to TBO but uh, I'm a Mike Bush guy so I'm gonna run them until uh, I see some problems with them um, the cost of ownership is this um, you factor in the cost for your maintenance for your uh, insurance for your training and then the cost of operation and then the cost to have the actual airplane which is in my case I took out a, a loan for this airplane so I'm paying a, uh, a cost every month for having the airplane and then I'm paying a uh, hangar cost all told what those look like uh, it's about a thousand dollars a month to own and the hangar is about three hundred and ten dollars per month the insurance is about twenty four hundred dollars for me um, and I'm a fifteen hundred hour pilot uh, with a instrument um, the training cost is roughly about oh four to five hundred dollars per year the uh, maintenance costs I figure eight to twelve thousand per year and uh, some years is going to spike. I just had the uh, boots done on the back here and those boots were seven thousand dollars. The boots up front here are going to be ten thousand uh, dollars and you can see where they've been patched over the years and it's going to going to take time. By the way I should say this this is 74 C 310 Q and I've got a five-year restoration plan that I started this year which is why I started on the boots I'm going to do the boots up here and then I've got to do the engines in the next two years and then the paint and interior and so it's going to take about another four years to get through all of that uh, but as I was saying the boots here are going to be right around uh, ten thousand dollars probably a little less uh, the cost is about seven to eight and the labor is about right at a thousand dollars or so um, so ownership cost let's look at the cost again so a thousand dollars for having the plane um, that's per month and I guess we should break it down per month the cost of insurance is going to be about two hundred dollars per month so it puts us at twelve hundred dollars the cost for maintenance uh, is right around um, five hundred dollars per month so we're at 17 training about 50 and the hangar space is 340 uh, 320 dollars per month um, and then the cost of operation so it's right at twenty one hundred dollars per month to operate this airplane uh, the cost is 25 gallons per hour to operate it and 25 gallons per hour at four dollars a gallon um, is a hundred dollars so hundred dollars an hour and I'm flying about uh, oh 30 sometimes 30 actually it's less 20 20 to 30 hours per month so that's a uh, you know roughly two grand there and in, uh, in operations cost so four to six grand per month so is the use of the airplane worth the investment of the uh, four thousand six thousand dollars yes absolutely um, my alternative is this um, the reason I've been using general aviation for commuting is because I tried and still do use civil aviation uh, that is going on the commercial airlines um, but here's the the kicker even in the three and a half hours to fly from Jacksonville to DC I still beat the airlines and that's because I don't wait in line for security I don't have to check bags I don't have to uh, go and get my car the car is brought out to the airplane the rental car is brought out to the airplane so I don't have to go to get that and um, uh, then there's the time of getting through the terminal and waiting in line for different things and whatnot you don't do any of that so my time to get to DC from Jacksonville I still beat in this general aviation 310 even though it's a three and a half hour flight the flight for um, commercial aviation is about an hour and a half to two hours and uh, you tack on to that the security 
waiting in line. General aviation others. beats commercial aviation when you are a certain distance, and that distance is right at 400 to maybe 800 miles away from your your target. Um, I go out to San Diego often, uh, probably two or three times a year, and that's not real often, but often enough that I want to fly out there, but it's a nine to 11 hour flight in the 310. So that's a flight that uh, civil aviation or commercial aviation is going to meet, is going to beat general aviation. So I don't try that. But in terms of commuting, um, general aviation can beat commercial aviation for ranges of um, 100 to 600 easily, 100 mile uh, radius. Uh, even in the Cessna 177 R RG, uh, I was able to beat the uh, commercial guys um, rather than having to take the commercial aviation. Door to door in general aviation, I've been able to beat uh, the commercial guys consistently for the past five years. In this Cessna 310Q, I've got uh, 530 WAS, 430 regular, a 696 that's panel mounted, an Aspen 1000 PFD, and uh, a Stratus 2. And that's the basics. Now for the engine, I've got a uh, EDM 9, uh, 760 for monitoring the engine in each cylinder, and a shade and fuel flow for looking at uh, totalizing fuel. All those are tied in via the RS-232 bus into the GPS and into the, uh, into the Aspen. And I put in a Flightstream 210 a couple of years ago, and so now that connects to the iPad. And this was probably the best modification I have made in the years has been that Flightstream 210. And the reason for that is if you had a Garmin 530 or 430 and you got uh, either Waypoints or Victor Airways or some other thing that you couldn't find easily on the unit, now you don't have to worry about it. You just put it in your uh, iPad and push the send button, whether you're using Garmin Pilot or uh, ForeFlight, and it's taken care of. And it cross fills across uh, the Aspen, the Garmin, the 696. Uh, it does not cross fill into the 430 because it's not a WAS unit. And so WAS and non WAS won't talk to each other. Thanks, Garmin. Uh, even though they should. But uh, that's one of the things that I've added that I really like was the Flightstream 210. Uh, there's now the Flightstream 510 that comes with the uh, uh, that comes for the units like the uh, 1000 and 3000. But uh, the 210, if you have a Garmin unit, Garmin GPS, and you want to be able to interact with your iPad, uh, it's $900 or so. Well worth it. Uh, the installation cost was a couple hundred dollars, so about $1,100 all in to get that installed and yeah, I'd pay it again. It's been worth that. Because even on reroutes, if you're doing a lot of IFR flying and you're in the air and you invariably get the call from the controller that says, hey, we got a reroute for you when you're ready to copy, you're able to punch it in and send it to the panel, no problem. For ADS-B, um, about two years ago, I decided to go ahead and take care of that. So when I did the Flightstream 210, I went ahead and t sent my 330ES back in to be upgraded for ADS-B out. And so this plane is now ADS-B out compliant, 2020 compliant. Uh, I do not have ADS-B in except through the Stratus 2. And that's one of the upgrades I plan on doing when I do the 430 WAS. I'm gonna get uh, ADS-B in either by doing a 345, a Garmin 345 or maybe a GDL 88 or, or something. I'll put something in to get uh, in into the, into the plane. Cool. Uh, right now with the 696, the Garmin 696, I do get weather uh, via Sirius. And so uh, I hadn't been stressed that much. And I also get weather, of course, on the iPad via the Stratus 2. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. To find out more about our aircraft prebuys and aircraft ownership solutions, head on over to our website, prebuyguys.com. To hear our weekly aviation podcast, search for the Airplane Intel podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or YouTube. See you soon and stay safe.